Okay, guys, so today we're talking about... If it's alive, I'm walking off a set. If anything bites me, I'm gonna, well, I gotta go. If anything gonna bite me. It, say? it says, process? grown in a lab, not alive, we promise. What if there's like a spider in here that's from a lab? All right, grown in a lab. We are probably talking about, we please be talking about diamonds today. Okay, we have some big jewelry. All right guys, so today we are gonna talk about lab created stones. We've talked a lot about on this channel about diamonds, about lab grown diamonds, about how diamonds are made, but we haven't done a whole lot about lab created colored stones. So rubies, emeralds, sapphires, the stones that you have seen a lot on this channel and they're really important to learn about, but what's really important is to know what are you looking at? Are you looking at a natural or a lab created stone? And that's what we're gonna talk about today because ultimately that's gonna make you all feel Feel more confident when you're purchasing jewelry, when you're at a museum, when you're talking to your friends. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna bring Elizabeth in because Elizabeth and I have both been in the business a while. And today we're just kinda, I don't know what you're gonna call it. Q&A. Q&A, we're doing a little question and answer. And this is just gonna be kind of like a fun light episode. We're all gonna talk about lab created stones. And we've got some pretty cool examples here. So let's bring Elizabeth in and jump on in. Thank you, Elizabeth, for letting me drag you in. Like, this is gonna be way more fun if I have someone to talk to about this. So yeah, that's what we're doing. We have both natural and lab-created stones. Yes. Okay, so we've got lab, uh, lab-created ruby. Yep. Lab-created alexandrite. Yep. Lab-created fire opal. It's actually glass. Oh, okay. So we'll get into that. I feel like an idiot. It, it's a very ruby, good simulant. alexandrite. Fire opal, sapphire, ruby, then ruby, lab created ruby. Right. Lab created yellow sapphire? Yeah. So as you can see, we have all of our examples right here. And that is super important because it kind of gives you the spread of options in the gem business. So I don't think if you were to just pull these out of the box without the card, you'd be able to tell immediately, oh, that is lab created and that is not. And that's why we're here to talk to you today. So it, it can be a little difficult. And so that's why a lot of times, you know, testing is important. Carrying a loop, if you're going to a trade show or something like that, if you can carry a loop, it is your best always. friend. In school in geology, they always told us trying to never cite ID when they were telling us about that, it's basically, even if your first opinion of it does turn out to be right, mm -hmm. eventually that's going to get you into trouble. Yep. Lab created gemstone means it was created in a lab by humans. So it was going through a process and typically those processes actually mimic nature, but in essentially like a sterile environment. So mm -hmm. instead of you having all this other stuff going on, you have selected just the components you need and then you mimic the temperatures and pressures that they would have actually grown in in the ground. So they kind of fall under two schools. You have your melt, processes and your solution processes. All has very specific equipment. Some of it's easier than others, some of it's a newer method, some of it's extremely old. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of secrecy involved too. No one really wants to let their like- Their formula out of the bag. Or so. their, how much heat they use or, yeah. I mean, it's very secretive, I would say. Yeah. Okay, so there's one. not one single answer. The, the thing that I use the most is, is it believable? And I, I hate to say that, but like, okay, if a pigeon, a pigeon blood ruby is like the epitome of ruby color. That is like. The, like the top. That is here. Top shelf ruby. That is top shelf ruby. Top shelf ruby. So when I'm looking at a ring or a piece of jewelry or even a loose gemstone and the price is not reflecting what necessarily the market would say for a natural stone. So that ring right there. This is much more affordable, even though this has the top color, it's beautifully clear, but at the same time, I know that, I hate to say it, if something was in my price range, it would not be as fabulous as this if, mm -hmm. it, if it is natural. So you can see the difference in these two. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at all of the natural inclusions, those little veils, the, you know, sometimes you get pyrite in it mm -hmm. and it creates a different look. And there's nothing wrong with this ruby. In fact, it is much prettier, at least to me. 
Right. And so, but there's ways that you can look at them and tell. So, so different inclusions. So types. different inclusions and things like that. So commonly with your lab created ruby and your sapphire, you'll actually, if you get your loop and you can get it in the right direction in a good amount of light, you can actually see these really faint curved lines. Curved that go, striae. Yeah, curved striae. And that's basically because. And that's because of the way that these are grown. So this is called a boule. And basically, depending on the type of process, there are going to be some examples that can will lead you to, oh, this is lab created and this is in this way. So for instance, I mentioned hydrothermal emerald earlier. Well, hydrothermal emerald has this like chevron growth pattern. Mm -hmm. You know that really popular pattern like circa 2016 that like- For like everything? Everything, <laughs> that the chevron lines, like you can see that in hydrothermal emeralds. Lab created ruby cut from a bull will show those curved striae lines and it's, you can kind of see them. see it in this can one. You show that. Yeah, you so that. what you might be able to see, and it's because the way that it grows is you have a flux coming down, and as it's coming down this hopper, and it's actually powder, it gets hit with two different gas. So it gets hit with hydrogen and oxygen, and then it melts everything together, and it falls on this little stand, and over time, it actually, you pull that stand downward so that this crystal grows upward. And so what you're seeing is you can kind of see, I guess there's like plop lines, where it just goes plop, plop. Uh, well, and it grows over time. What's that? <laughs> 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 But, so like for me, I can kind of see these striations on the top. I don't know if you can see them in the camera, but that's a really good hint because you don't see that in nature. Mm -hmm. Yes! yes. Jinx 10 you owe okay. me Thai food. So a simulant <laughs> gemstone is a gemstone that looks like another gemstone. Doesn't matter if it's red, green, orange, or purple, as long as it is simulating something of the same color. I mean, so honestly. So we talked about um, doublets. Right. And triplets. So like a garnet glass doublet is a simulant for a garnet. It is a, basically a poser. Yeah. It's. And so really with your lab created stones, your lab created stones are chemically and also like everything about them is the same except for where they originated. With your simulants, it can be anything. So here we actually have, this is glass. So this piece of glass was, you know, blown, made in a lab, and it looks, if I was to have this cut, they would look extremely similar. Mm -hmm. You really wouldn't be able to tell the difference until you tested it. And so there's some subtle differences in these two, even though they're both made of silica, but if I had, say I wanted a citrine, and this was more of a citrine color, it would still be considered a simulant. Mm -hmm. And then I could have a red glass, and it could be considered a simulant of a ruby, even mm -hmm. though chemically and all the other properties, they are very different. Yep. It depends on the material. So there are some materials that can be grown in one way, but not another. So I have never seen an emerald grown through, this is called a flame fusion process. Mm -hmm. It's often done with spinels and corundums. That's a melt process. And this is a melt process. Now, emerald is commonly grown through hydrothermal processes. Which is a solution process. Which is a solution process. And it all just has to do with how those crystals grow in nature mm -hmm. and how they are best put together in a lab. Like, how can we best mimic it. And so sometimes we have to get creative on different ways to grow things. Now, I would say that as far as equipment wise and probably expense, diamonds are probably up there just because of the requirements of the temperature and pressure right. that you need to make them. But again, this is a very secretive process and Elizabeth and I have not been granted our, we don't have security clearance to get into those labs. Uh, no, <laughs> no. But I mean, like I've, I've seen drawings and yeah, some pictures cool. and basically with lab grown diamonds, you essentially have this very high pressure, high temperature. I don't really want to call it a pressure oven because it's a little too simplistic, but that's kind of the best thing that I can come up with. And you pretty much increase the temperature and pressure over time to create the diamonds out of the materials that you put into it. It's pretty much takes up like a whole room. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a big machine. And then you end up with like a box about this big. <laughs> so it, it really requires a lot of a lot of uh, energy to make. Cool. Some of these methods are 1800s. either relatively new or they are a few hundred years old. I know that the flame fusion technique, which is one of the most popular and widely used, was basically brought into use in the early 1900s. It's an older method, but we really had to go through pretty much like the industrial revolution to really get a lot of the technology mm -hmm. to even study and then mimic how to 
how to grow these stones. Diamonds. Yeah, I actually really I like hydrothermal lab, emerald. I love lab-grown diamonds. I think they're yeah. so pretty. I See, want a lab-grown pink diamond. Ooh, I have seen those, those are pretty. They're really pretty. They're really pretty. Super pretty. I think for me, I really like hydrothermal emeralds. You can see them in a lot of early jewelry. So like your 1930s, mm -hmm. 40s type jewelry. A lot of those emeralds in there are actually lab created. And I think that's really neat. So I've been to some antique stores and looked at rings and you know, seen, seen those structures that I know are supposed to be there for those pieces. And it actually creates a really, I don't know, it looks, it looks really real to me. Like just, it looks natural. Mm -hmm. but at the same time I know a lot of people would probably get confused and I've actually been in stores where they had it marked as being like from Columbia or something and I'm going no no so I think and some of it is too it depends on the materials being grown so and what methods you use so some of them just don't make sense from a monetary standpoint because it may be more difficult than others one thing though is is that since I don't really know the cost associated but depending but thinking back to how long it took us to get some of these mm -hmm. lab grown or lab created stones I would say that the technology needed thus probably an added expense in development research things like that I would say probably one of the more expensive would be your lab grown diamonds that are used in jewelry so we've had lab-grown diamonds for a while, but they were only industrially used. And it was because they didn't have the color or the quality that could actually be used in jewelry. So now that we have gotten to that point, I think that because of the amount of time that it took, and that's only in the last 10, 15 yeah, years, I mean, maybe. who knows? So it, it's taken a lot longer than some of these other ones, because mm -hmm. like Renewally Flame Fusion, that was back in the early 1900s. You have a lot of these methods came out in the 70s. Okay. And then all of a sudden you have the widespread manufacture of gym quality or high, you know, just absolutely beautiful lab-grown diamonds. And so that was kind of the last thing to come to the market now. But I, I would say not knowing the cost, that would just be kind of my, yeah. my assumption and opinion. Oh, well, did Both. you know that there is lab created corundum, which is sapphire, in your cell phone? Yeah. Apple. I think I've heard rumors that Apple uses it on the screen or the home button. Also, when you're at the grocery store and they're scanning your food, the glass plate. The glass plate is corundum. Lab created corundum. And it really kind of depends because we use a lot of natural industrial grade diamonds as well as lab grown industrial grade diamonds in industry in you know drill bits and different things we use i've seen synthetic mica which i never thought was a thing but you know depending on where it's needed we actually i think predominantly now depending on the method i would say a lot of stuff is actually used like industrially or in commercially like in our homes and things like that and then you have the gemstone market and it's kind of this totally different animal. Yeah, so I think you could say that, you know, lab created stones are beneficial for both in and out of the jewelry business. And I am sure there are a number of different industries outside of jewelry that depend on them. Mm -hmm. yes, oh yeah. For sure, it expands Definitely. the market. There's more affordable options. And if you're like me and you're really picky about inclusions and things like that. Super picky then you can find stones that are a certain size, if that's what you're looking for, that are very affordable, have the quality that you want, and don't take a million years to find or break the bank. So they all have their place. I love both. I will say I lean more toward natural, but that's because I like mineral specimens, but I do love a nice lab-grown stone. I, I personally love lab-grown diamonds. I like how you can get them in color, you know, colored lab-grown diamonds. Yeah, it just depends on, I guess it just kind of depends on what movie yeah. you in, right? All right, guys, I want you to take a closer look at the ruby. It's Indian. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to, okay, so this is ruby from India, but look at that really cool host rock. I mean, could you imagine finding that and then mining the ruby like that? But could you also imagine finding this? I mean, that's pretty cool that that's the same gem and just two different ways to procure it. Can yeah. I say that? Produce it? Procure it? Procure it. I do love a good color change gemstone, and I'm gonna take this little guy out, you know, and I think this is pretty cool. So these are chemically both the exact same stone, but truthfully, I like this alexandrite a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so you guys can tell just the immense difference between the two, and even though one came from Russia and the other one came from a lab somewhere in the world, you know, it's, it's really neat that we can have both.
All right, I think this was a fun episode. Let us know what you guys thought about the question and answer session. Guys, like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on what's coming up next on the channel. Send Elizabeth a big thank you, and go tell us what your favorite lab-created stone is. Comment below and let us know. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.